Finally, we are at an end. Episode 5 of Prehistoric Planet, Forests, has finally dropped. Does the finale live up to the hype? Is it as good as all the other episodes? Is the show as good as everyone says it is? Will I even answer these questions? Stay tuned. If you care about spoilers and haven't seen episode 5, make sure you go watch my initial thoughts on episode 1 through 4 before watching episode 5 and then watching this episode. Forests starts out with a small pod of Ostroposeidon, Ostroposeidon being a large sauropod known from South America. These guys don't have like the most interesting color scheme, but the specific type of reddish brown they decided to use I found kind of interesting. I like how freaking thick they are, and the spines along the midline from the back of the head to the end of the tail is kind of interesting. Kind of an homage to the Diplodocus from Walking with Dinosaurs, but the spikes almost look more like soft tissue like scales, and not so much like bony spikes, which were the ones that were on the Diplodocus in Walking with Dinosaurs. Another homage to that episode of Walking with Dinosaurs is when this group of Ostroposeidon decide to wreck the forest by just smashing up trees and pushing them down and eating up all the leaves. And from there we go to a family of Triceratops. I find it interesting that they decided to go with the horizontal goat eyes for Pachyrhinosaurus in the last episode, but then decided to go with a rounded bird-like eye for Triceratops in this episode. Why the inconsistency? I don't know. But the Pachyrhinosaurs are Centrosaurs, while Triceratops is a Chasmosaur. So you could kind of be like, well, there are two different groups of the same type of dinosaur, so the eyes could be different. Plus, eye shape is sort of indicative of habitat preference and uh, physiology. Why do one thing on one dinosaur and something different on the other dinosaur when they're two closely related dinosaurs and then not explain that detail at all? Some might not even notice it there, but but explaining the update or the speculation of eye shape would have been interesting is all I'm saying. Another interesting inclusion on all of the Triceratops is a difference in the horn shape. Some have their horns going up and then down, some have them bending up and backwards, some having them go basically forward, which is what is seen on basically every single Triceratops skull. Each one is different from the others. So it's really cool to see that, but it, you know, an explanation would have been educational. The Triceratops herd goes to a cave looking for clay to eat to help them digest or protect their digestive tracts uh, from poisonous plants that they eat, which is based off of a large number of different animals alive today, mostly mammals. As you've probably seen from one of the clips that was released from this segment from this episode, one of the babies gets lost in the cave while the group is looking for their clay lick. Eventually the baby makes it and meets up with the group and it stands there in the half in the shadows and half in the light and it would have been a perfect scene to have a jump scare with a predator that followed and caught the baby and killed it and offer us some action but that doesn't happen unfortunately. From the Triceratops segment we then go to Carnotaurus. Carnotaurus being in South America, which is not mentioned in this segment at all. The Ostroposeidons are also in South America, and I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure they don't mention that. The Carnotaurus segment is the highlight of this episode, I think, with the Carnotaurus doing a mating dance reminiscent of some birds of paradise, and also some spiny scaled lizards, where they have this blue patch on their arms and underbelly and chest. Here the Carnotaurus has blue patches on the underside of their arms and they use their arms as a display. And this is the speculation in the episode that they decide to explain in the Prehistoric Planet Uncovered segment, which is good because this is one of the standout segments in this whole episode. Unfortunately, the poor guy did not get to smash. 
I honestly think they could have pushed the speculative nature of the whole display even further with the inclusion of skin flaps on the arms or some sort of feathers or quills or something to make the arms bigger and more obvious. Not necessarily in color, but physically larger. As has been shown in a lot of speculative artwork like the stuff in the All Yesterdays, which this whole documentary series is clearly derived from. Another thing to note here is that the osteoderms or the the large round scales in the skin that are arranged in organized rows is inaccurate. And unfortunately, the people who made it didn't have a chance to change it with the update of Carnotaurus after the publication of the paper on the skin impressions of Carnotaurus. So though it may be technically wrong, it's not wrong enough to be a mark against this segment or this episode. The color scheme of the Carnotaurus is reminiscent of the color scheme of the Carnotaurus in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom with the oranges and reds and stripes, which I think is really cool because that offers up a cool juxtaposition between the two designs, obviously this one being more true to life. Another piece of speculation that they could have gone further with, I think, is the horns. The horns are pretty much similar in shape and size to the bones. Now, they could have made those things a lot bigger. Now, I'm not saying to go all the way as in this piece by RJ Palmer, because, you know, that's quite out there. Still not impossible, but, you know something more interesting and all of the theropods in the entire show that have a keratin crest don't have the keratin colored which i find really weird because the keratin crests and hornlets and all that sort of stuff has been hypothesized to act as a display structure for a long time and none of the theropod dinosaurs throughout this show that have these keratin crests use them for display in fact, in the freshwater episode with the Tyrannosaurus, when he does the mating display, it's with his throat sack, not his horns. Now, I just think you could have gone further with the idea that the keratin horns and spikes and crests are for display, especially here with the flesh-eating bull having the large downturned horns. From the Carnotaurus segment, we then go to the fall autumn segment of Eastern Asia with the Chanchosaurus and Corythoraptor scenes. Here it's pretty much obvious an homage to tigers hunting deer, as that's even how the camera is used, kind of where it tracks the predator and then it cuts to the actual attack. The Corythoraptors here are kind of the brightest colored dinosaurs in this entire show, and I like that a lot. Though the color pattern is not quite complex, it's just straight up blue, which is cool. With this segment, we finally get a full good predation scene where we see the predator go after the prey and tussle and kill it. We saw a predator prey scene in the last episode, but we didn't actually get to see up close of the Nanoxaurus attacking and killing the Pachyranosaurus. It was from afar, and then it just jumped to them eating it. And here I come to another thing that is starting to get on my nerves with this show, is the lack of blood and guts. Now, <laughs> I understand that this whole show is to show them as mundane, beautiful animals that are just doing animal things but the natural world that, that we actually live in is full of horrific stuff. Just the absolute goriest, nastiest things. And most of that stuff happens with mammals. Mammals are like the worst, just the absolute worst animals. Because we see that the Chanchosaurus is effective in killing the Corythoraptor with giant teeth that should have gone straight through and snapped off the neck and head, but we don't see that or any drop of blood whatsoever despite it killing it with its teeth that should have sliced right through it. The lack of blood and guts in some scenes, I'm not saying to go gratuitously about it, but the lack of it almost seems more unnatural than the inclusion of it because trying to dispel the myths that dinosaurs were bloodthirsty monsters is good and they're doing that here, but they did, just like any animal, they did have the propensity for violence, and the predators had to kill to eat, and plenty of herbivores are some of the nastiest animals alive right now, so the lack of that just seems like they're trying to make this palatable to everyone, to the detriment of the actual entertainment of some of the scenes. 
From the Chanchasaur scene, we go to the forest fire scene, whose main character is an Atrociraptor. They show the Atrociraptor as quite intelligent, using a piece of smoldering charcoal to smoke out any insects that it has in its feathers, which is a piece of behavior seen in a vast majority of animals alive today. The Edmontosauruses are back, nothing much to say there that hasn't been said already, and an inclusion of an animal that was missing from all of the promotional material is an Ankylosaur, specifically Anodontosaurus, not Yoplocephalus or Ankylosaurus, which you can tell by the shape of the head being more Yoplocephalus-ish, and the tail club being absolutely huge. That's a specific characteristic of Anodontosaurus. From there we go to a nighttime scene which starts off looking at uh, bioluminescent mushrooms and fungi, which is really cool. But at this point in the show, it's clear that they're trying to do this time-lapse sort of thing, and I'm not sure how effective it is. From the mushrooms, we see a sleeping sauropod, and the creature that comes after the sauropod suggests that this whole segment is taking place in Mongolia, or at the very least, East Asia but obviously a different region to the last Chanshousaurus segment, so the sauropod should be some sort of Mongolian sauropod, but the model that they used for this sleeping sauropod is the same one used for the Ostroposeidon at the beginning of this episode, which is a South American creature. So it seems almost like they should just not have included this sauropod in this segment, especially considering it's only here for minutes or less, and not much is explained about them except for the uh, air sacs in the skeleton, causing stronger snoring, <laughs> which would have been a good explanation to include in the narration about the Dreadnoughtus scene back in episode 2 when they have their inflatable air sacs, which is the most obvious part of that scene that was never explained in the extra explanation segments. The main characters of this scene are the Therizinosaurus, my favorite dinosaur finally getting its due. And on top of that, we get to see babies. Young Therizinosaurus, and th I think they're probably the cutest babies in this entire show, but that's just my bias. They're cute little munchkins, and I want to pick them up and squeeze them because they're so thick and chunky little chickens with little death hands and ginormous bulbous heads. And the segment has them climbing, which is really cool. You never, you're never going to see a Therizinosaurus climbing like that and because they're tiny they can climb and they have the claws to help them climb and they climb up this tree to eat bees no actually they climb up to eat the honey from the bees and they're having a hard time of it i'm glad they didn't have the bees kill the baby therizinosaurus because that would have made me cry the end of the segment has an adult therizinosaurus come in and knock the beehive down from the trees and then it eats the honeycomb and leaves this is the best Therizinosaurus ever put to screen, and is a nice juxtaposition to Jurassic World Dominion coming out soon in being a much, much, much better, more realistic and accurate interpretation of a Therizinosaurus, despite the fact that there is no neck or head or tail of Therizinosaurus known. The adult Therizinosaurus just kind of gobbles down a whole chunk of the beehive, so it definitely swallowed some bees. From there, we go to the last segment of the episode of Hattuck Island. Now, the big drawback of this section is that it is never referred to as Hattuck Island, and Hattuck Island is never explained as to why it is weird. It's really weird, because it's a string of islands in what is now Romania, which housed a bunch of miniature dinosaurs. What happens when mainland animals go to an island, they tend to shrink, or if they were small, they tend to grow over evolutionary time. And the largest predator on these islands wasn't even a dinosaur, it was Hatsagopteryx, a giant Ashdarka pterosaur, which is the main character in this segment. Now, I couldn't tell what the prop, the big obvious prop was of this episode. So if anyone can tell me in the comments what they think it is, that'd be great. But I think it's possible that the close-up here of the baby Zelmoxes, a miniature iguanodon native to these islands, I think this head is the prop only because of how high the fidelity of the detail of the scales of the head is. And in this close-up shot, the head doesn't really move a ton, it's kind of just stationary, and the only thing moving is the eye and the soft tissue on the snout and the nostrils, which could easily have been CGI'd to move, or it could have been a puppet. 
because you don't see the mouth moving, which indicates it could have been a puppet. But it could also just be how really good the CGI is. Unfortunately, one of the baby Zalmoxis gets nabbed by the Hatsagopteryx. Hatsagopteryx gotta eat. Hatsagopteryx is easily the best pterosaur design in the entire show. The colors and patterns with the stripes and the browns and the tans and whites and then the orange giant crest, it just is the most interesting to look at, especially compared to the Quetzalcoatlus, which was just a grayish brown. And the way that the Hatsagopteryx is portrayed here is a heftier, bigger creature, which, you know, it wasn't really bigger, but it was heavier. It was thicker, had a bigger head and a shorter neck. Then we are shown Telmatosaurus, a miniature hadrosaur, and the colors and patterns here are also reminiscent of Gabriel Iguetta's work and is also similar to the Edmontosaurus and Allura Titan color schemes, so that kind of fits. The sauropods are never mentioned, but I assume they are Magyarosaurus or something similar, because they're definitely not the Brachius or Europasaurus. I like how they're representing the ecosystem here almost better than they've shown throughout the entire show, of all these different animals coming to the shore to lick salt off of the plants and rocks, and that's when they get to spread their legs and their wings, and the Hatsagopteryx stretches and then flies off majestically into the sunset, and that's how it ends. Would have been cool to have a bookend epilogue by David Attenborough, but you know. So overall, I think the series gets a 9 out of 10 from me. The weakest aspect of the show is definitely the writing or the pacing of the whole thing, and that it's the writing is weak insofar as it seems like the whole show is prioritizing visual entertainment over education because barely anything is explained. Now, I prefer this nature-style documentary to the Talking Heads sort of documentary, but I do think that you could have included the same type of information that is shown in the, the Uncovered segments in the actual documentary itself. Like, each segment of the episode could have been, like, each segment of each episode could have an explanation segment that was only a couple minutes at the end of it that moves and transitions into the next segment. So it's almost like an illustration of an hypothesis and then you explain the hypothesis after you see the illustration. There's also a lack of explanation of the locations of a lot of the segments. Not all of them. The narrator definitely explains where some of them actually are. A lot of them are left to the imagination, I guess, which doesn't really help communicate science to the audience, especially if this is meant to be for the general audience, which I think it is because of the lack of violence or nasty stuff. Otherwise, why not include that besides budget and time? That seems to be what this whole show is restricted by, is budget and time because it comes off as a tech demo to show audiences and the general populace how the science of paleontology has changed because there hasn't been an updated look at all of it like this before, especially with the incoming Jurassic World Dominion ready to spread more stereotypes about dinosaurs and the science of paleontology, despite the fact that there's basically no paleontology in the Jurassic World trilogy whatsoever. It's all a mess. It's really just kind of weird because Dr. Nash has to do his own science communication for his own show on Twitter because they don't have the time or the money or the something to include more of a um, educational explanation of the things that they're showing besides does Velociraptor have feathers? Does T-Rex swim? Do Tyrannosaurus hunt in packs? I think the best uncovered segment was the one about the Barbary Dactylus sneaky male thing, because that actually explains why they did that and its correlation to things like that happening in the natural world alive today. Another good one was the one for this episode, which explained the small arms of theropods and how they could have been used as display structures. But that was just one segment of the episode. So at this point, I have Coasts and Deserts as a 9 out of 10. They were my favorites. Coasts was the most engaging one. You had your action, your, your dinosaur fights, your creature fights with the Mosasaurus fighting and the Mosasaurus eating the baby T-Rex. Then you have your T-Rex and you have your beach combing scene. You have everything you want. Then you have the Elasmosaur versus Mosasaur scene and you have the Ammonite scene. And that was all just extremely engaging, even though we were bouncing around a bit to different parts of the world. Desert 
parts was also engaging to me. I think it had the Mononika segment, which I forgot to include in my initial thoughts of that episode. It had the Cisternosaurus migration thing, and that was really interesting and well explained as well, as opposed to a lot of the segments that don't really get a full explanation. So from there, I have Ice World as the 8 out of 10, the next one. I really liked that one. It was the least disjointed one, the most cohesive one. And then Forests, I put at an 8 out of 10. It was a really good send off for the show. It was as engaging as some of the other episodes. I just would have liked a little bit more stuff going on. And Freshwater I have as the weakest episode at 6 out of 10. Still being a good documentary, I, I mean, overall, but in and of itself, I felt that it was disjointed, didn't know what it was doing, had basically no connection to Freshwater besides, like, oh, this dinosaur lives, like, this, this dinosaur is doing a thing near water, or Dinochirus is in the water eating plants. The visual aspect of this whole documentary is bar none, the best documentary ever. So that's my thoughts on episode 5 and the entire show. Uh, I hope you liked it. I enjoyed it thoroughly. This has been the coolest Five Night event I've been a part of, and it was kind of like how I assume Walking with Dinosaurs was for people who were old enough to watch that on TV when that came out. So let me know what you think about episode 5 and the whole show in the comments section below. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe for more stuff like this. I will be getting a thorough, in-depth review of each episode, each and everything that they decided to include in each and every episode better than they did. And I will also be analyzing the cinematography, the writing, the directing, so on and so forth. So stay tuned for that. Those are going to be very long videos and are going to take a lot of time to edit but I will try to get them out as soon as possible. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons Ray, Isaiah Garza, Dinosaur, Christoph Hubinger, Biotiverse, and Arda Bayer. And another thanks to my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons The Dogman, Iron Bladesman, Danny Van Heck, and Dana Manchester.